What is a second? To most people, it's 1 86,400ths of a day. But if you ask someone at the NIST, US's National Institute of Standards and Technology, you'll get a different answer. They define a second as the amount of time it takes to measure 430 trillion oscillations of strontium atoms when they're in an optical lattice. But what does that matter to you? How important can a second be if the only way to get a true measurement is to have millions of dollars of lab equipment? Well, for many years, large companies could buy things like these. These are master clocks, and these things can cost thousands of dollars. They take in a super accurate time source like a GPS radio signal that comes from the NIST's fancy strontium clocks, then they distribute it over a network using protocols like PTP, or the Precision Time Protocol. Using PTP also requires special network adapters, and those can also cost thousands of dollars. But what if I told you I can replicate that setup? We can make time more accurate in networks all over the world using one of these, a tiny Raspberry Pi Compute Module 4. Well, you can guess from the fact that I'm making this video, I can. Thanks to the amazing work of people in the open source community, this compute module has two time travel tricks up its sleeve. It can send out a super accurate pulse per second, and it can do something called hardware PTP timestamping for the most accurate network time you can get. First, let's talk about pulse per second. A few months ago, Tom Scott posted a whole video about how radio clocks work. In Britain, the National Physical Laboratory, or NPL, sends out radio signals to coordinate clocks. The video has a great overview of how the NPL synchronizes the second between different locations, and it even talks about UTC, or Coordinated Universal Time. Don't ask about why the acronym doesn't match the words. In the US, we also have a radio time signal. That signal comes from a tower in Colorado, run by the NIST Time and Frequency Service. The radio station is called WWV, and you can even listen to it online. This is what it sounds like. At the tone, three hours, 54 minutes, coordinated universal time. It's pretty trippy. I have to admit, I've had that on in the background sometimes, and it's definitely a blast from the past when you hear the recorded voices. But here's the cool thing. If you have any radio-controlled clocks in your house, maybe an alarm clock or a wall clock, all those clocks use this signal, at least in North America. You put it in a time zone, and the clock will sync up after a few minutes. It takes a minute or two because those beeps and ticks actually store all the data for a clock to know what year, day, and time it is in UTC or at least NIST's version of the UTC. The PPS is easy to hear in that radio signal, but you can't really hear it in a wire. But thanks to some help from the team working on the Time Appliances project at Meta, I can show you what a pulse per second looks like on this oscilloscope. The latest PyOS kernel has PPS built in now, and you can enable it on the Compute Module 4's built-in network interface. That's this tiny little Broadcom chip. It'll output a signal precisely once every second over the Compute Module 4's sync out pin. Just as an aside, since I know you'll ask, the chip on the regular Pi 4 Model B and the Pi 400 don't support this. They're actually different than the one used on the CM4. But getting back to PPS, it's used in all kinds of timekeeping devices to synchronize them. Heck, even aliens see the value of having a signal to coordinate time. Do you remember in the movie Independence Day, that part in the beginning where the researchers hear the repeating signal? After studying that signal a while, Jeff Goldblum, or whatever his character's name was in the movie, figured out the signal was coordinating an attack. They're positioning themselves all over the world, using this one signal to synchronize their efforts in approximately six hours. The signal's gonna disappear and the countdown's gonna be over. Well, PPS isn't gonna bring about Armageddon, but the principle is the same. But PPS by itself isn't super helpful. We also need to know what the actual time is, and that's where PTP comes in. Like those series of boops and beeps in the WWV signal, PTP has a lot more information so computers can sync up over a LAN, or local area network. You might have already heard of NTP, or Network Time Protocol. Most computers use it nowadays. In my max date and time preferences, you can see it's using this Apple time server to set the max clock. But NTP has one major flaw. It was built for a less stable network path since it's mainly used over the internet. Usually, NTP can be accurate to under 50 milliseconds. Heck, some specialized NTP apps can get accuracy down to 1 millisecond on a local network, 
But that's still not accurate enough for many applications, especially in finance, manufacturing, and science. And that's where PTP comes in. PTP stands for Precision Time Protocol, and it's useful for keeping time in sync over a LAN, but not on the internet. Anything that adds random latency, like network switches that buffer packets or routers between networks, will reduce PTP's effectiveness. So it works best over simpler networks. And you might ask, why not just use GPS? Well, you can do that if you just have one computer, but it gets expensive if you have a lot. Plus, all those devices could still drift a tiny bit, especially if the GPS signal is lost, so PTP keeps them in sync. PTP sends a bunch of packets out, and the slave devices can calculate network latency with extreme accuracy without any interference from the host operating system. That's because PTP lives in hardware, on the network chip itself. And that's why only the CM4 can do it. Other Pis don't have chips with PTP built in. Since NTP runs in software, the kernel also adds a tiny bit of latency that PTP doesn't have to deal with. But this is just a lot of explanation. Let's see exactly what's happening with this oscilloscope. For this setup, there are two Raspberry Pis. I call them TimePi1 here on the left and TimePi2 on the right. Both of them have pin 9 here as the signal. That's this, the black wire on uh, J2. And pin 8 is the ground, the yellow wire. And those are going into channel 1 and channel 2 in the oscilloscope. And right now what it's doing is it's measuring when a pulse per second is triggered. So it's, you can see it's off by a bit here. Uh, the scope is on a 100 millisecond time scale. And right now they're probably off by like half a second, maybe you know, 300, 400, 500 milliseconds uh, from, from the time that both signals rise. And the goal with PPS and PTP is to use this network connection. The, the Pi is connected straight through to this other Pi, and then that network connection goes through the Pi's built-in NICs that are made by Broadcom. And it'll send a signal between these two Pi's from the master to the slave clock. I installed PTP for Linux and set up the first Pi as a master clock and the second Pi as a slave. And right now on the scope, that time scale is still 100 milliseconds, so the Pi's are still half a second off. But once I start PTP for Linux, the second slave pi jumps very close to the same time right away. And when I zoom in, you can see the accuracy is improving on the microsecond scale. And if I zoom into 20 microseconds, you can start seeing how the software learns over time the exact offset it needs for the network path it's using. I'll speed things up a bit since it takes a couple minutes to get beyond microsecond accuracy. And now I'm on a 100 nanosecond scale, so we're already just a few hundred nanoseconds off. And if I speed up again, you can see it down to the 10 nanosecond scale. So after just a couple minutes of calibration, my two Raspberry Pi's clocks are within 20 nanoseconds of synchronization. At some point, you get diminishing returns. So the software just kind of keeps a lock around 10 to 20 nanoseconds, at least on my two Pi's. But some hardware can get even more accurate with PTP. If I put the two lines on top of each other here, you can see that they even get within a couple nanoseconds of each other from time to time. So PTP provides synchronization, but there's no guarantee the time will be accurate. We need to sync up to UTC so we know what time it is outside of our local network. For that, most people just use GPS, but GPS by itself isn't bulletproof. And that's where the time card comes in. This is an open source hardware design that incorporates GPS and a high quality oscillator. In this case, a bit of slightly radioactive rubidium. I spoke with Ahmad Bayagawi who leads the Time Appliances project and does timing research at Meta, and he describes the time card design as a central part of getting more accurate time on every device everywhere. My goal now is like, I want to have every computer in the world precision time synchronized. And this goes like from mobile phones, like, like, uh, like all the way to computers, laptops, everything. And uh, that's why we like, okay, let's put it as part of the uh, time appliances project. So then a lot of people will work on this, contribute on this. And that's why everything about the time card is open sourced. I gave an overview of the time card in a video last year and Linus over on LTT even did a whole video on it, though their thumbnail is a little misleading. Well, I mean, it does work by exciting a slightly radioactive element, but the keyword here is slightly. There's this laser that basically uh, beams into this chamber. Inside the chamber, you have uh, the cavity and then you have, let's see if I can open it. Yeah, so inside the chamber, you have a little vial that has the, 
rubidium gas. This one is a little bit radioactive, but as you can see, I'm not dying. So, <laughs> not well, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the dose is very low. Probably, probably one banana, right? <laughs> Anyways, the time card is a completely open hardware design, and after my last video, some people complained there was still a little bit of software that was closed source. Well, that's being addressed. The early version I tested needed some software from NetTime Logic to get it working. But Ahmad said they're in the middle of rewriting it to be completely open source, so there won't be any aspect of the card that requires closed source software at all. I'll get back to the time card someday, but I want to focus back on the Compute Module 4. With the GPS hat, the Compute Module 4 is an honest-to-goodness Stratum 1 NTP and PTP Grandmaster clock for less than a hundred bucks. Well, a bit more if you want to use an atomic clock for times when GPS goes out. It can't replace high-end network cards for every use case, especially when you need lots of bandwidth or have thousands of slave devices, but Lassie Johnson from Timebeat was pretty upbeat on the prospects. It rivals uh, network cards, uh, which are $1,000 uh, in terms of uh, performance, in terms of accuracy. Obviously, you can't have the same sort of uh, uh, bandwidth throughput as you can on those high-end adapters. But specifically for Sync, uh, the, the result is, is, is genuinely excellent. And what if the time card in its atomic clock is overkill? Well, Timebeat and the Time Appliances Project are working on a new Pi hat called the Time for Pi. It uses PPS and GPS and will make an extremely affordable tiny time server. This thing could replace multi-thousand dollar grandmaster clocks, and everything about it will be open source. Lassie from Timebeat also worked on the Linux kernel patches for PTP on the CM4, and here's what he had to say. Okay, I have this view that um, you know, these purpose-built appliances uh, that exist, uh, so grandmaster clocks from the traditional vendors, um, you know, I think in, in 2022, they're about as relevant as the appliance web server from, uh, you, you know, the Rec Cube was in 1998, right? Bringing costs down and making it easier means more people can have super accurate timing, but Heck, what does any of this mean for you? I use this material to pick up girls. Uh, <laughs> you know, high, high accuracy time synchronization. It's, it's a crowd police, all right? <laughs> well, yeah, it's not as impressive as some things, but if we could guarantee nanosecond level accuracy in all our devices, it could improve things like citizen science projects, PC gaming, and communication. So this is in one aspect. But let's say when you go for these competitive games, I can actually control what you're seeing at the same time based on the latency, put everyone basically at the worst case scenario and then run everything at the worst case scenario and do the judgment based on when the clicks happen by the people because they're seeing things at the same time. PTP isn't all perfect, of course, no standard is, but that's why companies like Timebeat are building functionality to monitor and self-heal timing traffic. And that's why the Time Appliances project is completely open. I mean, seriously, go check out their wiki. If you ever wanted to nerd out about time, check out some of the presentations like this one about optical timekeeping at NIST. So today, nanoseconds matter for finance, for massive databases, for 5G and factory automation. But once more of us have devices that can keep time accurately, maybe we'll see even more improvements in things like game design and communications. I know for me, I plan on setting this thing up as a Stratum 1 PTP time server in my home lab soon. Maybe I'll be the first home labber with a time server in my rack. Until next time, I'm Jeff Geerling.